Let's go ahead and we'll open up to Mark, chapter 12, and we'll begin with part two of what is the greatest commandment. And we'll read the text once more. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself, is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So we're again, we're beginning the, to answer the question, what is the greatest commandment? And so we can ask that this question is often asked again and again with various things. Remember, if we could ask the question, what is the greatest musician? And my wife would say Bach. And the things that he's composed... We could ask, what's the greatest movie? And I know TJ is our movie buff, right? Or we ha- what is the, the greatest movie that has ever been made? When we think about what is the greatest, we must begin to understand what is the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then the second part to that is to love your neighbor. If you would uh, think of how people relate these two and how people forget the necessary connection between these two. For in other words, some people want for good fruit, but they don't want to be connected to the root. The root is the love for God. The love for God is what produces the good fruit of love for our neighbor. And we can't have that good fruit of love for our neighbor without a true and genuine love for God. And we cannot, we don't have a true and genuine love for God if we don't have love for our neighbor. There's no life in that tree if there's no fruit. But you can't have that fruit apart from connected to the root of this tree. And so true love of God is connected always with love for our neighbor, love for our family members, love for people that we live with, love for uh, those who are our neighbor. And so the first commandment is the trunk of the tree, the first part of our commandment we covered this morning, love for God. The second part is the branch with its fruit. So we remember the things that we covered this morning. In verse 28, we saw who came to Jesus with the question. We saw why he came with the question and what his question was which is the first commandment of all in verse 28 and then we begin to see who it is that we're to love in verse 29 it's the lord our god the lord who is one and then we saw what we're to how we're to relate to him in verse 30 we are to love the lord our god with all our heart soul mind and strength this is the first commandment So now we're picking up in the second part of Jesus' answer in verse 31. And tonight we'll look at verses 31 down to 34. And if you have your outline from this morning, you can follow along and remember that we'll complete the part of the great answer. And then we'll look at the scribe's wise response in verses 32 to 33. And lastly, we'll see in verse 34 how Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. So we're picking up mid-sentence from Jesus Christ where we cut, we cut him off earlier this morning to begin to fill in the rest of his teaching, the rest of his ex- explanation. This, fir- this greatest commandment has two parts to it, and now he begins to describe the second part to it. So in verse 31, 
He says the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we're, we're remembering our, our definition from this morning with what is true love. Did anybody write it down? It was long? <laughs> I'm going to give you another opportunity to write it down. <laughs> so our biblical definition of love, a selfless, enduring commitment of the will, a selfless, enduring commitment of the will to care about and benefit another person by righteous, truthful, and compassionate thoughts, words, and actions. It's long because it's detailed. It's long because it's describing what love isn't and what love is. And so we, we covered this morning about how it's selfless. We'll need to deny ourselves. There needs to be a commitment of the will. It's not simply emotions. It's not simply how you feel. But it's a decision and a, comp, a um, commitment of the will to, to care about and benefit someone. And you can't do that by your own decisions, your own description of what love is. You have to do that in a righteous way. You have to do that in the way that God has outlined by His Word. You need to do it in a truthful way. And you need to do it in a compassionate way. In the thoughts, words, and actions that we do. And so the, Jesus picks up in verse 31. And we in verse 30 we had love towards God, which is godliness, as opposed to godlessness. And now in verse 31, we have goodness towards man, as opposed to unrighteousness. You can't have the first without the second, and you can't have the second without the first. And when it's truly together, love for God will produce love for man. That's why they are one command with two parts. And so, you can't start in this way. How you feel, you can't start with man. And your own thinking about what love is. If you end up bringing in your own definition of what love is, then you will turn your definition of love into great sin. And so we see that today in the way that the America talks about love. Without, apart from God's law, apart from God's word to define what that love is, apart from that truth, it's essentially how I feel how I can affirm someone, no matter what they do. As long as I'm affirming them and encouraging them, then that is love. But the law of God defines what the love is. We can't make up what love is to our neighbor. We need to hear it from God, what that love is. And so in Galatians 5, all the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of love as being patient, kind, Long-suffering, not prideful, not parading, but instead rejoicing in the truth. Romans 13, 8 to 10, speaks about how he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So these things go together. The law teaches us how to love one another. And so when you look at the law of God and you begin to analyze it, Take the Ten Commandments, for example. It will teach you how to love one another. When the law of God says not to murder, you know that it also teaches you not to hate, teaches you not to be angry, teaches you not to have a murderer's heart. But it also teaches you the opposite. It also teaches you the necessity uh, to care for the spiritual well-being of another, to care for the good of another. When God has said not to commit murder, he's also teaching us that we need to protect life. We need to love and not hate or be angry. When God says to honor your father and mother, it's not simply disobedience to them, but it's in teaching us the importance of the positive. To honor, love them is to, uh, not to dishonor them, but rather to... To work at how you can grow in respect, love, and care for your parents. When we consider the, the command for adultery, and not to, we know it says that not to commit adultery, and we know in the heart not to think it, not to commit a, uh, lust. But then we think also the law is teaching us how to love, how to love our neighbor, 
in that we are to think in a way that would be love for your spouse or purity in singleness, waiting for the one that God would have you to be with. When the, the law tells us not to steal, we know it's love not to take the possessions of another. But it's also love to do the opposite, to seek and to provide for others, to care for the poor. That is love. We know that the law tells us not to lie. And so certainly protecting the truth is loving to, our, to one another. But also we not to, we're not to slander one another. We're to be very careful with our mouths and how we speak about one another in order to help them and edify them. And so we're learning and we're defining what love is by what the commandments that God has given. That's what it means in Romans 13 when he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. If you really love, then you will look at these things and you will look to fulfill these things with one another. And the love is fulfillment of this law. If you are loving, then you are doing these things. We know that the law says not to covet, not to desire what someone else has. But then we need to think of how to be loving by thinking of what others need and what their desires are. How to help them beforehand. What's interesting is if you look at Leviticus 19, verses 10 to 18, where it describes some of these things things of the moral law, you can begin to see already how in Leviticus these things are described, not only the negative, but also the positive. It was already there in the Old Testament before, and then it's just repeated and expounded and explained all the more how we are to love one another. And so uh, we must remember the, the foolishness that it will lead to. The, uh, if we do not have the law to define what love is, then love it just is, becomes our own feelings and emotions and completely contradictory. If I say that, that I believe that it, it's, it's loving to be a homosexual, and then someone else says it's loving not, um, not to abuse someone sexually, or um, if I believe, if someone says pedophilia is the next thing that's coming up in America, right? Where they'll say that's the next letter to add to the LGBT. Um, and so if that comes in, um, the next letter, see the foolish contradiction between what is defined as love and then protection for children. And needing to, the, you can see the contradiction between opinions and feelings about what love is. We're hopeless and helpless apart from God defining what love is. And so we consider these things that Jesus is commanding us and teaching us. This is the second part. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? This is the Jesus teaching uh, this very fact. Someone asked, how do I love my neighbor? And so Jesus tells a story. She te- he tells a story full of racial tension, a story full of a, a, uh, a Samaritan who has racial tension with a Jew who ends up helping him out and the religious people don't. And so Jesus uses this example, this example where it, it was a dangerous thing to help for that Samaritan to help the Jewish man. It was the Samaritan put himself at risk in order to help him on the side of the road. And so we're learning from this example how love is costly. It will be painful to you to love one another. Sometimes it's dangerous. Sometimes it costs financially. And it's not for just those who are like you. Or those who think the way you do. This story teaches us how to love one another. Charles Simeon says about uh, this passage that we must do all that we can for another's spiritual good. It's not simply the physical good that was in mind. But to the greatest extent, with the greatest excellence, with the greatest importance, 
We need, if we love God, we need to love one another. Look at how Jesus defines it now in verse 31. He puts the qualifier on it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Many have picked up this phrase and say, ah, see, you need to love yourself first before you can love one another. But that's a, a twisting of the commandment. That's a twisting of the idea. Self-esteem and self-love are not taught anywhere in the Bible. You don't need to grow in pride in order to love one another. No, you need to get rid of pride in order to love one another. Pride is the hindrance, the obstacle, the great obstacle to love. Only humble people love. Only humble people love. And so when the psychology abuses this saying, Christian psychology abuses this saying, saying that you need to learn, love yourself, it's, it's a simple lie. That's, that's like saying um, that you need to grow in pride and, or foolishness in order to love. Your problem is not too little, is not too much self-esteem. The problem that we, why we don't love is too, we think too highly of ourselves. And when we think too highly of ourselves, then we won't love one another. So, are you willing to, what it is teaching then, what is it teaching then? Are you willing to love one another with the same intensity, the same fervency, the same amount that you naturally love yourself? You naturally are planning out, what am I going to do after the service? What am I going to do tonight? What am I going to do tomorrow? You're naturally thinking about yourself. I'm hungry. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. I'm young. I'm old. I whatever. You think you naturally think about yourself. And so Jesus is saying, since you naturally think about yourself, the commandment is the second part of the greatest commandment is to think about others with this same fervency, this same uh, lo- uh, intensity, this same amount. Ask yourself and all the things that you seek for yourself. Do you seek that good for others? Are you willing to do good for yourself only? And so we remember Jesus uniting these two commandments in verse 31. By, and we observe again, like we did this morning. Look in verse 30. This, at the end of verse 30, this is the first commandment, singular. And then the second part of verse 31, there is no other commandment, singular, greater than these, plural. So Jesus has this one commandment with two parts. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. It is pure. It is righteous. It stands as a great standard to us. So now that we've seen Jesus' great answer, let's begin to look at the scribe's wise response. This scribe was originally coming with a plan to test Jesus, meeting with the, the other Pharisees. And now... He decides to throw his question to Jesus, and he decides to throw Jesus a fastball right down the middle of the plate, and Jesus knocks it out of the park. Home run. Jesus is rounding the bases. He comes in. Everyone amazed at the, the, the beauty in which Jesus answers, the succinct nature in which he answers. And the scribe, originally coming to test Jesus, now begins to look and to become won over. By what Jesus has said. So the scribe, in verse 32 we read, So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, to love one an- one's neighbor, is- oneself, is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the scribe says, This was a good answer. This was right. This was an excellent answer. Well done, Jesus. Well done. And he responds and he, he says he refers to cheat, um, Jesus as the teacher with a term of respect. There's no other scribe in Mark's account who's responded in this way. This man is responding in a different way. And so what he says is Jesus has said the truth. He admits that Jesus' response was reasonable. And leads to the greatest happiness, the greatest holiness, and it displays the worth of God. The scribe has nothing but good to say about Jesus. 
So this scribe doesn't have the same evil motives. He's not filled with the same pride and hypocrisy as the other spiritual leaders. And he points out what Jesus said about God and who he is. In verse 32, is right. There is only one God. Perhaps the scribe is thinking of Isaiah 45, where God describes that he himself is God alone. And he describes how his sovereignty and how he alone knows the future. In verse 33, we see him comment about what Jesus has taught. He summarizes the same statement that is beautiful, and we've repeated it many times with all the heart, all the understanding, all the soul, all the strength. And he he repeats in a slightly different way. And that helps us to understand that what Jesus is saying in verse 30 is not, another, is not a description of, of who man is and a four-parted being or a two, three-parted being. He's not, he's not describing that. He's describing what it means to comprehensively, what it means to truly love God. And so we pick up in verse 33 where he says, To love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. He says all the the rituals that we would do, hypocrites can take delight in those things. Hypocrites can take delight in ceremony. Hypocrites can do, can come to church. Hypocrites can pray. Hypocrites can evangelize. Hypocrites can read their Bible. But what Jesus says has gone beyond that. It's more than simply ceremony. It's true religion. It's true worship. How much easier it is to do those things than to truly love your neighbor as yourself. The moral law is good for its own sake. The moral law that God has given us, these commands in the Ten Commandments, are good and righteous and holy. And the ceremonies that God has given us are good and righteous and holy. For you to be here tonight on His day is good and righteous and holy. But then... What he's saying is going beyond that. Going beyond what the the hypocrite can do. So when you think about this this description of what the, the scribe is saying to Jesus, you can think about someone who is in need of a particular item. They're in need of food, let's say. They're in need of food, and you have the food. You have the bag of food. And you're um, you're out somewhere. A distance, we are in the, in the country. The country of Bithlo or wherever. Where do you live, Pastor Rick? Mims. Mims, Mims, way out there. <laughs> way out there with the natives and everything. No, no place to eat, no place to buy food for a long ways. <laughs> you got food. Somebody needs food, and you give them five bucks. But you got the food in your hand. You see? What you should do what you should do is give them what they need, right? Why give them the money when you can give them what they need? And so Jesus, the ceremony is like the money. The, the love is like the, the, the bag of food. What does God want? What does God want? You can use the ceremony to love him. It's true. You can use the service to love him. You can use the prayer time to love him. You can use those things, and you should. You should. But what does he want out of those things? Why does he want you to do any of those things? For love. For love. And so, what the scribe is saying is true. Where all the burnt offerings, all the sacrifices that you can give to God, they are good. It's good to give sacrifices and offerings. But why would you give them? Because this is the heart of the commandment. And it's greater than all the ceremony. So we've seen the second part of the commandment in verse 31. We've seen the scribe's wise response in verses 32 to 33. Lastly, let's look now at Jesus' encouraging statement, you are not far from the kingdom. Now when Jesus begins to describe in verse 34, now when Jesus saw that he'd answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Jesus looks at the scribe and sees he's answered sensibly. He's answered thoughtfully. He's using his mind. Sin has not blinded him like others, like the other religious leaders. 
He's able to see what's right. The man also wanted to do what is right. But notice how wise Jesus' statement is. And so well balanced between encouragement and yet stating the truth. This man is still yet unconverted. But Jesus doesn't just rebuke him or confront him. He says an encouraging thing, and yet at the same time as saying an encouraging thing, there's still an exhortation in it. Do you see that? By saying you're not far from the kingdom. Imagine somebody's in line at Disney, right? You're in one of those an hour and a half long lines. And then you get up to the front, and you get all the way up, and then they close the doors to whatever ride, and you're the, you're the last, you're the very front. And the person working at Disney says, um, means to encourage you. And they say, you're not far from getting on the ride. <laughs> you are the next one. <laughs> By saying that truth, Jesus is admitting, you're, you're not a Christian. If you died now, you go to hell. But he does it in the nicest possible way you can, you can do it. <laughs> this man is not attacking him, Jesus, anymore. He, Jesus has a different response with those who are hard-hearted. He responds to them in a, in a hard way. But with the man who's soft here, the man who's seeing the depth of what Jesus is saying, he means to state the, his, his horrible state truthfully. But in such an encouraging way that he's next, he's right there at the doors. Why is he right? Why does Jesus describe him in this way? Because to understand these things, these hard truths that are not easy to understand, it's easy to talk about love, it's easy to have a false definition of love. But for this man to comprehend the true nature in which Jesus is talking about love for God and love for neighbor and how that is the greatest, for him to truly understand these things or to understand, is to understand a profound truth. And so understanding of these things prepares you for the gospel. It prepares you and teaches you for the need, your own need for the gospel. Submission to God's rules, values, and purposes in this world is preparing this person, helping them to understand what it means to be a Christian. And Jesus is speaking from a human perspective. From a human perspective, he's speaking and addressing this man, encouraging him that he would be, should, should move on, not stay, be content with where he's at. The person who's at the edge of the net to get on the ride, right? They're the first person. They're not content to stay there, but they're encouraged. They're encouraged and how far they've made it and how little yet they have to go, right? And so Jesus wisely does this. It's like saying you're just on the other side of the road. So wake up. Wake up. Don't be content to where you're at. Don't stop there. Come all the way into the kingdom. Jesus does both in an encouraging way, in a truthful way. And yet in a warning way. A warning way that if he were to stay there, he's not in the kingdom. If he were to stay there, he would not go to heaven. He needs to come to the next step, the next, the next step of what the law is driving him towards, what the law is teaching him to do. With us in the count of Mark, we're left to wonder what will happen to this man. We find no more about this man, whether he's in heaven or hell. We'll find out one day, right? But Mark closes this text by saying, and no one dared question him anymore. But no, after that, no one dared question him. Jesus has defeated all his enemies. And now after this, he'll, he'll go on the offensive in verses 35 to 37 or 35 to 44. Jesus has perfectly answered all the objections. No one can dare even come to attack him anymore because of how clearly he makes the truth, but how, how clearly he refutes their false religion and exalts what God has given us and described as true religion. And so, when we close, we want to think about Jesus' statement about how you're not far from the kingdom. <clears throat> 
And we want to heed the warning and take the encouragement. We heed the warning and take the encouragement by doing the same thing. By considering the same similar truths that the law of God teaches us here. This commandment is pure and righteous. This commandment that we're to love our neighbor teaches us about God. It teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about our need for Christ and our need to love one another in the same way. See how this side is of the, the greatest commandment. Like we saw the greatest commandment, like a great rock, right? A great mountain. Walk to the other side of this great mountain and you will see the other aspect of it. The other aspect of this great hill, this great mountain. So if God has taught us that loving one another is the, the great part of the greatest commandment, what does that say about God? And how He loves one another. How He loves sinners. It teaches us His great love that He would make and connect this as part of the greatest commandment. It teaches us that He spreads this by teaching us, His true children, to love one another. It's the expression of His love that why He's done this. Why He's connected these commandments. When we look and, and think about how, we've loved, how we have not loved one another, this commandment teaches us great goodness in God, great love in God. But it also teaches us our great lack of love for one another. When you think about how you lack of love for one another, you can, you can do it in ways you can think about categories. You know, uh, with your wife, you can do it with your children, it's different. You can do it with your extended family. You can do it at work. You can do it at church. You can think about um, strangers. You can think about friends. There's many different areas and circles in your life, right? And sometimes you sin, and we sin in different areas, in different areas of life. And we, we always need to be considering how we can love one another. And it takes great wisdom. It takes great discipline. It takes great humility. And the truth is, this commandment is another pure and holy commandment. And all the commandment will do, if left there, will say the truth to you. It will say the truth to you. That you have not loved like you should. We have not loved like we should. We should have had the law define what love is, not our own hearts. We should have said the truth, but said it with a loving way. Not trying to cram it down somebody's throat. We should have grown in many, many ways in love for one another. The law is there to be pure truth. To stand there and tell you the truth. You're a sinner. You're not loving. You have not loved like you should. And so we were, um, we we can do this by thinking back on all the people that you've hurt. You can think back and the people that you've loved the most in your own life. At many at times, you have hurt them the most. You can remember the tears in their eyes. You can remember how something you have said, something you have done, has been the opposite of love. That's what the pure law does. It teaches you God is holy and you are sinful. But what does it do? To, how does it drive us to the gospel? Look again at 1 John 4. Connecting these same things. 1 John also connects these two parts of the greatest commandment. 1 John 4. Beloved, 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone lo who loves is born of God and knows God. 
But he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so we, we see here the call to love one another, and then everyone who has this love, this true love, it's an a- the attribute of a Christian. But everyone who does not have this love does not know God. And so the law again defines this, this love. And then we're told the gospel in verse 9, once again. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So when we think about Jesus Christ, we think about someone who is continually and always loving his neighbor. Not only did he love God with all of his heart and all of his soul and his mind, but he loved his neighbor. We see it when he's on the cross and he prays for the forgiveness of those who are crucify him. We see it in the, even as he's attacked here in Mark 11 and 12 and how he's attacked and how he uses it for be love, to love others. He's loving you even now today by reading of this passage, by teaching us of this passage, by using the, their sin to begin to love others for generations and generations through his word. His love is a, a great love all throughout his life. His righteousness was pure and evident to all. The disciples knew that he loved them. Sinners knew that he loved them. Remember the sinful woman who comes to him at at Simon the Pharisee's house and comes crying to him, wiping his feet uh, with her hair, washing his feet with her tears, And Simon the Pharisee says, if this man was a righteous man, if this man was a true prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was. And Jesus explains to him, this woman, have you, he says to Simon, have you greeted me like this woman? Have you washed my feet like this woman? And why? Why did the woman do that and not Simon the Pharisee? She was forgiven much. She was forgiven much, and so she loved much. And so the gospel teaches us by the great uh, seeing our great sin and how we have not loved like we should. It drives us to the gospel. And then we love him much because we love him the, um, in how he loved us as sinners. The gospel drives us to love God and then to love one another because of his great love and how he died on the cross for a sinful people like us. When you think about how you've not been loving, whether it's a family member, a spouse, a child, workplace, stranger, where is it, who's, what's the face that you think of that you, where you have been guilty? When you remember that, where do you run to to comfort? If you only run to you, the way you'll correct it, the way you'll do better, to have a, a clean conscience, you won't be able to persevere. That's not the way God wants you to fight that and to correct that. He wants you to remember the gospel. He wants you to remember that, that you at once again He wants you to remember once again that you are a sinner and that you are in need of the gospel. Don't forget that many years later, somehow forgetting that you were a drunk, somehow forgetting that you were immoral, somehow forgetting that you were disrespectful to your parents. Remember these truths that were in your life. And the gospel is our only hope. For this forgiveness, the gospel is what gives us the clean conscience that he has paid for our sins and that we deserve to be abandoned because of our lack of a love for a neighbor, but he did has not abandoned us. Then the gospel teaches 
that you go on to repent and grow in love for one another. And we continue in 1 John and see these things in the same chapter. We, we see verses 20 to 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? You see how Jesus connects these commandments? They must be together. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Jesus now marks it and says this is a mark of repentance. The person who does not grow, the person who does not turn from their lack of love, the person who continues in that path is not a Christian. And so we've seen how God commanding us to love our neighbor reveals God's love, God's goodness, God's holiness. We've seen God commanding us to love our neighbor shows our sinfulness, our guilt, our depravity. God's commandment to love his, uh, the, for us to love our neighbor teaches us we need the gospel and that only Christ has been sufficiently righteous in loving his neighbor and only his work on the cross is sufficient. That's where our conscience will be cleansed. And lastly, God commanding us to love one another gives us the light, gives us the, the light for our path on how we are to walk, how we're to live. And so I would close again with practical counsel on how to grow in this way. Um, meditate on and ask others how you can love them more. You may be surprised what you hear. You may be humbled by what you hear. You have to. You may have to be resolved to say, "I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to. I may need to uh, zip the lip, right, uh, and just ask the question." And maybe the person will say something that's partially true. Well, um, pick the seed out of the manure pile and and use it to plant your your next garden, right? Um, it will <laughs> use what they tell you that is helpful and true. You filter it through a biblical grid. Filter it through a biblical grid. Don't just uh, understand and use the law of God and what they tell you and how you can be loving. But be, receive it. Receive it and a analyze how can you grow from the things they have told you. Pray that you would grow in love for one another. Sometimes you're just blind to it. Sometimes you think you're really loving. If your conscience is, is completely clean from these, this sermon or the first and the first one, and you think you're the most loving thing, then uh, I would encourage you to pray that for God to help you to see where you need to grow. Perhaps you can grow uh, in love for God by being more humble. <laughs> so you want to grow in love for others. You have to trust God in loving others because it will cost you. You got to be willing to open up to others and to be willing to be hurt. It will cost you, but it'll be worth it. You have to depend upon the Spirit. By hit the Spirit at work through His Word will help you to be loving to one another. You have to hate selfishness. Selfishness will destroy. All of the love that you would have for another when you focus on yourself and thinking about how you can love yourself. It's the opposite of biblical love. Associate with others who love. Hang out with them. It's easy. It's, in some ways, it's, it's hard because they can, they can show you your sin. In other ways, it's encouraging because it can edify you and lead you along to grow. You want to love others? Grow in obedience to God's Word. That, that definition of God's commandments of love will help you to love one another. Consider the opposites of the commandments. Meditate on them. I listed them. Can you, can you recite them? You can recite the Ten Commandments. Can you recite the opposites? What is the opposites? If the negative is this, what is the positive that you should be pursuing in order to love one another?
consider the different people in your life. The different You sin in different ways with different people. And so consider those different realms. So we've seen here today, the, the great Savior, the greatest person, teaching us about the greatest commandment. We can debate all, all day about who's better, LeBron, LeBron or Jordan. Who's better, Ronaldo or Messi. What's the greatest kingdom? Who's the greatest musician? But we have it very clear what the greatest commandment is. It is pure. It is good. It is holy. It stands there teaching us about the holiness of God. But it also, in the reflection of this this great commandment, we will see much sin. And so it should drive us. This greatest commandment was given to drive us to the gospel, to the foot of the cross, where we would put our confidence and our trust in Jesus Christ. Turn from all self-love. Love God who made you. And love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment is a light to your path on how to grow as a Christian. He does these many good things in our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is easy to talk about commandments. It's much harder to live them. It is easier to preach about them than it is to live them. It's easier to listen to a sermon about them than to live them. So we pray to you now. Lord, we want to grow in love for you. We lay out our lives now before you as a living sacrifice, saying, please help us to grow in love for you. We know that sometimes it, for you to answer this, this prayer request, it's sometimes hurtful. It's sometimes a trial, sometimes a difficulty, sometimes a pain. But we're praying, Lord, we want to love you more. We know that you deserve it. Lord, we want to grow in love for our neighbor. We know it reflects your glory. We know you're worthy of obedience to this command. And we're expressing our inability. We're expressing our need for you. Help us to hate it. Help us to hate a lack of love for others. Help us to be willing to be humble, to be corrected, to love one another. Thank you, Lord, for how the, the commandments teach us about the gospel. Thank you for how they teach us about you, how great you are, how, how we can see your reflection in this law. Thank you for showing us our sin, and thank you for teaching us about the gospel and our need to grow. Help us, Lord, now. Amen. Thank you.